Thank you very much. Good evening. This is going to be a little unusual because I have learned over the years that it is far, far better to be honest with God's people than to try and con them. This is the first time I've preached at something like this for five years because I've been sick and I very nearly died and I didn't. And for some reason, your folks were kind enough to say, well, could you still come and preach? <laughs> and so I took a little trip with Ruth to Africa and we tried in Southern Africa to see if despite um, having suffered from septic shock badly, I had lived to tell the tale and I seemed to be able to preach. Tonight we're going to find out. Why, <laughs> why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because I want to ask you to pray in a way that you perhaps would not normally pray for a preacher. And that is, pray more for him than you. But then pray that you may get a word from God tonight that will change your life. One other thing to say, and that very simply, is that you'll also see me walking around with a cane. Now, generally, that means knee or something similar. It doesn't. Uh, it means that uh, my feet have been fused to my legs. They've been stuck on by a friend of mine uh, <laughs> nine, <laughs> nine years ago, who's a brilliant foot surgeon, because everybody said, you'll never walk again. And Ed said, yes, you will. And I'm still walking, but it, there's no balance. So if you do see me rolling around or anything else, don't worry about that. We know that I've just, I'm just telling you so that tonight lots of things could go wrong. And isn't this going to be fun? <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, it's a good job that we're your people and tonight is your evening. And we give it to you and we pray that you'll speak to us in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight's subject was given to me by you, and I'm delighted to be able to share on it. You asked me to speak on love your enemies. Because one of the things that is happening in our world is that Christianity is no longer the subject of apathy. It's now, it's now becoming the subject of opposition. So instead of people politely ignoring us, we're actually feeling some straightforward opposition. And it's really important to remember what dear old Corrie Ten Boom said years ago, you never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you forgive and love your enemies. There are so many biblical illustrations of loving your enemies. Joseph in Genesis 45, Moses in Numbers 12, David in in 1 Samuel 24, Elisha in 2 Kings 6, Jesus in Luke 22 and 23, and of course Stephen in Acts 7. The principle is very straightforward. It goes beyond forgiveness and establishes something that is a fundamental Christian principle for all time. We are supposed to be those who do not just tolerate our enemies. We love our enemies. Many years ago, I, I had the sort of dubious principle, uh, privilege, at least as far as they were concerned, of trying to give an element of leadership uh, to the churches, uh, the evangelical churches in the four countries of the United Kingdom. What happened was that we encouraged some of the members of parliament to pray for each other. And so they would pray in threes. But each of the three had to be a member of a different political party to themselves. And they had to pray for one another. There is something about that that changes the climate of a culture and a nation. 
Scripture insists, if your enemy is hungry, give him food. That's in Proverbs 25. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall surely release it with its owner. Exodus 23. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. That's in Luke chapter 6. Pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5. And scripture reminds us that God himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men and women. So if we would live as sons of the Most High, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. Is this still true today? A few years ago, Ruth and I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina. And while we were there, one of the interesting things that I had to do was try to get some of the guys together to talk to each other and to pray for each other. And all appeared to be going quite well until one night when they got me going on talking about the world and what God is doing. Now that's dangerous. <laughs> because nowadays people have made an art form out of their own prejudices. And have started to believe what either CNN or Fox News tells them. And assume that if they've seen it on TV, it's got to be right. And they can therefore follow it and use it as a guiding principle for life. So I asked people a really simple question. What is the fastest growing church in the world? What nation is the fastest growing church in the world? Not a difficult question. I couldn't get a single person to give me the right answer which I thought was incredible. Do you know what the fastest growing church is in the world? China. No. Was China, but you're 50 years behind. <laughs> Sorry, that's, I'm not trying to be rude. It is, it is still one of the three fastest, so you're not doing badly. What's the fastest growing? Iran. 19% last year. 19% the year before. Hands up if you've been a committed Christian. You've sold out your life to Jesus and you've lived a life of surrender to him for at least two years. Thank you. If you were Iranian, you'd now be a church leader. You are a veteran. If you survive five without finding yourself in the Evan prison, you're very fortunate. Normally, the minute you've been in the Evan prison, when you come out, you'll be exiled, not to return to your country again. That's why Iranian churches in the cities of this world are outstanding for what they are producing because what's birthed in hatred and persecution lives to the glory of God. So the Iranian church is amazing. And I was simply talking to these Christians in Wilmington about the church in Iran and forgot for a moment that our TV screens had been buzzing with the fact that Iran is one of the axis of evil threatening America today. Now that may be true or not true. 
The only question you've got to ask yourself is whether it's terribly important. Because the really significant thing, if you love my Jesus, is what is he doing in a nation? 19% growth is off the planet. God is doing something extraordinary. And I remember the first time when I preached in Iran over 20 years ago and could not believe what I was seeing. Nowadays, the Iranians have got a mission field developed for themselves. Their mission field is Afghanistan. And it's incredible when you see what God is doing. Can I tell you a story? Is that all right? I was preaching. Now, we're not going to tell you where. In one of the neighboring countries where we bring prospective and existing pastors out of Iran, train them, and send them back in. And while I was doing this, one night was just a really lovely night. It was packed with folks just like yourselves. And afterwards, a guy came up to me. And he said, uh, would you lead me to Jesus? I said, yeah, I'd be delighted, but let me get a couple of my friends here to come and join us. And I thought, I'm not going to get stuck with this. My Farsi is almost non-existent. And I want the follow-up to be done properly. And I said to this, this guy, well, do you understand what you're asking? He said, yes, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. The Jesus who came to a cross and hung and died out of love for me, who broke out of the grave and is living as Lord of Lords and King of Kings and who one day will come back for me. I said, well, it's not a bad start. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're doing all right. He said, um, yeah, well, will you pray for me? I said, well, probably. <laughs> but I, I want these friends of ours to, to join in because I want them to make sure afterwards that you know what it is to live a surrendered life to Jesus. He said, great. I said, and I'm not going to pray for you anyway because I'm going to get you to pray for you. And so he just quietly and gently surrendered himself, asking for forgiveness from the King of Kings and offering his life to Jesus. And then I prayed for him very happily. And uh, the Iranian believers who were with me gathered around him and I said, which tribe are you from? He said, I'm Afghan. I thought, great, an Afghan Christian. This is fabulous. I said, what's your name? He said, oh, I'm Muhammad. I have always wanted to bring Muhammad to Jesus. <laughs> I thought that was... Now, I don't want you to get this wrong. I have no problem with a sincere Muslim who seeks to live by that faith. But all they're doing is following a religion. And I don't follow a religion. I've come into a relationship. And Jesus doesn't offer you a religion, a set of principles to believe in. He offers you a relationship, a God to know and to love and to trust. And that's what makes Christianity different to every other faith. It doesn't give you someone to believe in. It gives you someone to have a relationship with. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And the amazing thing for me as I've watched people coming to Jesus is to recognize that they are discovering the relationship that they have looked for elsewhere and not found. But finding it in Jesus, I, I find to be absolutely amazing. And to see what God is doing, I find it really difficult when I'm told that I have to hate people who my Jesus is bringing to himself. When I'm told to, ha to despise nations, when my Jesus is transforming them. 
and to be told that I have to reject nations when my Jesus is accepting them. Not as nations, but as people who will come to him, love him, and trust him. And if you could possibly be here tomorrow morning, Ruth will tell you a story that will break your heart about what God is doing in that part of the world. It's hard to deny biblical truth when you claim to love Jesus. And it is phrased as bluntly in Scripture as this. Love your enemies. And that principle may be denied by our culture, but it is clearly affirmed by the Word of God. Scripture says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 20. F.F. F. Bruce once put it like this. The best way to destroy an enemy is to turn him into a friend. John Calvin, many years before, said, Assuredly, there is but one way in which to achieve what is not merely difficult, but utterly against human nature, to love those who hate us, to repay their evil deeds with benefits, to return blessings for reproaches. As Augustine said, love all men, even your enemies. Love them, not because they are your brothers, but that they may become your brothers. Thus you will ever burn with fraternal love, both for him who is already your brother and for your enemy, that he may by loving become your brother. Therein lies the secret that what God is looking for is a people who will love their enemies, do good to those who despitefully use them. And how do you get to love your enemies? Well, it's a process. Let me give you the four stages. Number one, come to those who can't stand you and you can't stand (laughs) and ask them for forgiveness. I love the way that my Jesus says from a cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Acknowledge whatever degree of personal fault may belong to you and me in the breakdown of relationship. Establish good ground for moving forward and allow God to heal our memories that we may move into a new day. Together, we can then create under God a different kind of tomorrow. You've only got to turn the TV on and realize that we have got it horrendously wrong. We've concentrated on creating discord, on breaking down relationships, on causing disappointment and distress between people and fostering dissent among one another. There has to come a moment when the Democrat will begin again to see what is good and of God in republicanism. And the Republican will begin to see what is good and of God in the Democrat and discover that it's not a matter of what is contained in a creed, but it's a matter of what is there in a person. And you may follow a faith or a way that seems entirely unacceptable. Someone else may do that, but you can still love God for what he's doing. Are you familiar with the fact that Britain is losing its prime minister? This is quite serious, quite serious. Did you know that three days ago there was a parliamentary prayer breakfast when people, Christian leaders, gathered together to pray for the nation? Did you know 
that one of the candidates to now become prime minister, who comes from another faith, was sitting there with his wife, who's a believer, and listened to a friend of mine preach Jesus and realized that there was a God doing something in the nation and started to ask if this was the moment for change and what part he should be in that change. God is moving. God is doing something. A different tomorrow is possible in each nation that we may represent. And that together we can create under God a different tomorrow. Just after the massacre in Buffalo, a woman was interviewed and she acknowledged that she knew personally no less than five of the victims who died. Consequently, the interviewer asked a follow-up question. What do you feel about the shooter? Her response was to suggest that we were duty-bound to forgive him. And asked the interviewer, as Christians, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Why on earth have we sucked up and swallowed the lies that our society has poured into us, demanding that our natural attitudes are exactly what we should be producing in the face of what is happening. Isn't it time that the people of God rose up to demonstrate a whole different kind of living and a whole different kind of thinking and a whole different kind of reacting where we love our enemies and do good to those who despitefully use us, where we forgive those who've committed such crimes. There was an American chaplain in 1945 who was called up on the telephone and given the good news that he'd got a new job. He was still going to be an American chaplain in the forces, but he'd got a new congregation. His job was to go into the cells in Nuremberg and to minister to the Nazi war criminals who were on trial for their lives. He tells the story how Goering would not listen and committed suicide. He tells the story how a number of people just rejected everything he wanted to say. He also tells the story of Nazi war criminals surrendering their lives to Jesus. Some of them died, some of them lived but each of them you will one day meet. If they surrendered their lives to Jesus, and so have you, you're going to have eternity together. What I found so distressing that night in Wilmington was to be told by Christians I had known for years <clears throat> that you cannot expect any of us to love our enemies. Scripture demands it. To be told that Christianity is not about loving your enemies. Oh yes it is. It always has been. To be told that it's possible to live a different way than that and still be a Christian. Dave Brubeck, the uh, jazz musician, once said the most profound statement in the Bible and arguably the essence of Christianity is to love your enemies and do good to those that hate you. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. That's what we're supposed to be like. Love your enemies is not a super deluxe kind of Christianity. It's the real thing. 
If a guy wants to rip you apart in the local newspaper and make all kinds of slanderous comments about you, you have one instruction in Scripture. Love him, pray for him, do good to him, and change your world with a little bit of the love of Jesus. When you learn how to sit at the table and eat with your Judas, then you'll have learned to understand a little more of the love of Christ. And as Abraham Lincoln once observed, the best way to love your enemy is to turn him or her into being your friend. There has to be something different in this faith that we espouse. It's got to be something that the world will never understand. We are called to move away from a fixed concentration on ourselves to a perspective that is based upon others. We too readily forget that Jesus himself was a refugee in Egypt. We need to care for the refugees who no one else have time for. Scripture says that what we do with the widows, the orphans, and the strangers depicts the kind of Christians we are. It's not all about hugging each other and having a good time together. It's about being out there in the pain and the need and the problems. And our sins are not just those of commission. It's not just the things we do. They're also the things of omission, the things that we fail to do. Anger, hatred, and resentment are not supposed to be part of our lives. Loving our enemy is supposed to be. I want to give you a simple 10-step process <laughs> to love your enemy. Stop. Breathe. Detach yourself. This is not natural. This is not normal. This is not easy. On the streets of Wilmington, I was told that Christians don't have to love their enemies. My Jesus said the opposite. I had to stop, breathe, and detach myself before I lost it. <laughs> Secondly, we've got to put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. Thirdly, we've got to try and understand what makes them tick. Fourthly, we have to try to accept them for who they are. Fifthly, we've got to forgive and surrender the past. Six, we've got to find something in them to love. My old friend Graham Kendrick, who some of you who will remember dinosaurs will also remember. <laughs> the days that I remember. Graham once uh, was living with Ruth and I and he wrote a song because uh, he and Ruth had had an argument. And his song was very simple, teach me to love the unlovely. Oh Lord, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> teach me to love the impossible people I really don't like. I don't naturally take to some folks. I can't work out the way that they are. And on and on. And poor Ruth has to find something in him to love because that's the instruction of scripture. We've got to view others through different lenses. We've got to discover common ground. We've got to open our hearts to former enemies. How do you lead a Nazi war criminal to Jesus? Easy. You do it with the love of Christ. And tenth, you reach out to them. As Martin Luther King said, Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. It's amazing to realize that God wants us to be different. 
He wants us, thirdly, to realize that we are family. Scripture tells us, uh, you find it in Galatians 3, that in Christ there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, because we are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, please don't get upset with me for this. As those of you who know me will know how heartfelt it is. In Christ, there is no black or white, no bond or free. There will be no, don't get annoyed with me, it's intentional. There will be no American Christians in heaven. Regretfully, there will be no British ones. <laughs> I think it could lower the social ambiance immensely. <laughs> but John 3.16 points out that God so loved the world and that you ain't going to have your nationality in heaven. We're going to be together and simply be brothers and sisters. All one in Christ Jesus. And what is so important is to recognize that we are supposed to be living that way here on earth. There is supposed to be something about who we are, what we do, how we live, how we view others. We are not supposed to be xenophobic. We're not supposed to be elevating one culture above another. We're not supposed to be regarding ourselves as superior or better. We are supposed to be one people, loving each other, commending each other, supporting each other. A friend of mine died recently. He had replaced me as head of the evangelical churches in the UK many years ago. I had trained him for that. He's black. When he died, the black churches decided that they would have uh, a whole series of seminars in his honor, looking at what it meant to love and know Jesus. And they invited 11 of the key black pastors worldwide to contribute to this. And I got this message. We know you're old and a bit past it, but... <laughs> <laughs> we need to have at least one Mzungu. If you don't know what a Mzungu is, it's a white to an African. We need at least one white face in this contribution. So would you come? I tell you, it's absolutely magnificent. My youngest son has the same job I once had in the UK. And he was asked about the same time if he would come and speak at a prayer meeting. I'll let you into a secret. Preachers don't like preaching at prayer meetings. Because people come to pray, not to listen to you preach. <laughs> but my son Gavin reluctantly agreed and said to the friend who invited me, invited him, where's it going to be? I was told it was going to be in one of the big London stadiums. And Gavin said, how many people will be there? The guy said, well, they're coming to pray all night, so there'll only be about 40,000. <laughs> Gavin said, where will they be from? He was told they'll almost all be Nigerians, but who live in London. And Gavin got blown away by preaching to 40,000 Nigerians who'd come together to pray all night for the world in which God had put them. We've got to realize we're family. We've got to realize that we're together. And we've got to live like it too.
who's been married to this man for more years, twice as many years as most of you have lived on planet Earth. <laughs> Clive, it's been wonderful to see you preaching tonight. It's been a very hard few years. No, it's worth hanging around 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and you never can remember your this believe that you could possibly be this ancient, but you know, still a little bit of life left in us, so <laughs> loving your enemies is a challenge. We live in a day and age where we stand up for justice. I don't I'm not talking necessarily in the biblical in the church. But in the world, we're taught to think it through. We're taught to stand up for the First Amendment. And how dare anyone, you know, knock us down or take away who we are. And I come from England, where you're taught this more, you know, and yoga comes from Europe. I mean, we're told to think through things, to debate. You don't just take what you're told, you debate everything. I remember our daughter had to write a, an essay when she was 18 at school, proving that John the Baptist, no, Lazarus wrote John, the Gospel of John. And in England, it didn't matter whether it was factually right, it's how you put out your debate. And I think we come to the point, we think, we're Americans, we're Europeans, we're whoever we are. We have a better understanding of life than people in these other countries. That we know how to think these through, that Americans know how to lead in the world. I'm sorry, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I'm American as you are. <laughs> Not properly a thoroughbred, but... Uh, <laughs> but I've got the paperwork. <laughs> And I, well, first of all, I gave my life to the Lord on a hillside in Lebanon as Israel was bombing Beirut Airport. We didn't know that's what it was. I was there doing the equivalent of Peace Corps. I was with a bunch of kids from Lebanese Youth for Christ. And all I saw were bombs falling out of the sky, machine gun fire going on nonstop. And here was I, a little pastor's kid from London, and I was terrified. If I die tonight, where will I go? I had gone forward at every appeal you could ever imagine. I was terrified I would never get into heaven because I wasn't good enough. I had it all wrong, and I lived in fear. And on that hillside, I met Lebanese young kids, teenagers, who in that time of bombs and that machine gun fire and helicopters whirring overhead, they just prayed and thanked God that they could trust him, that they could leave their families in his hands, that they knew him, they were assured, and if they went to heaven that night, they knew there was going to be a welcome. And I thought, they're religious nutters. <laughs> then I thought, no, they're not. They're showing me what Christianity is all about. It's about surrendered lives and living in the trust and the assurance that God is with you. And he will welcome you home one day, but we are to live to his glory. And that, that's continued over the years. That I have learned so much from people indigenous to their own countries. People who don't live like I do. Who don't have what I have. But they have a relationship with God that just defies belief that they will love their enemies, that they will recognize that we are responsible. We're all made in the image of God, and we are family, but we're not necessarily all in the kingdom. And we meet many, many people who have been imprisoned for their faith, who have gone through terrible things, and yet keep on loving. Because the only thing is when we don't forgive, we are tied forever to that unforgiven 
motive and action in our lives. Let's learn to forgive. It's not something I've found easy because I'm feel justice. We've got to get it right. You've upset me or you did this. Stuff it. <laughs> we can't live like that. Are we going to move on in today's world? <laughs> With Jesus. <laughs> I want to tell you about two people who are very special. Lived in Rwanda. They lived through the genocide in 94. Nin- 94? Yes, 94. When a quarter of the population were killed. And Rwanda was technically known as a Christian nat- nation. They were Christians killing Christians. And we had a wonderful member of staff at World Relief. His name was Pierre. Pierre was married to Malen. And Pierre and Malen loved Jesus dearly. And in the genocide, they were, they were both Hutus, which was the dominant grouping in the society. And they hid Tutsis, 27 Tutsis in their home. Tutsis were the basically ruling group. They were mainly known for being tall and slender and distinctive and more in the government and moneyed. So they were despised by the Hutus. And our friends Pierre and Milen hid 27, not in a mansion, not in an American home. I don't know how they did it. They had them crawling through cupboards and all sorts of holes and was amazing. And they hid them and loved them. And none of those Tutsis were killed. But Pierre was under great resistance from the community. And they wanting to kill him, he got shot at, he got injured, he was under threat all the time. But in their home, they had a small room, very tiny room, but it was a prayer room. And every morning, Pierre would get up at 3.30 and pray every day of the year. And he would pray for three hours. And when you went to his home and you walked in that room... You couldn't stand. You literally fell on your feet. You knew you were on holy ground. And before you fell, you took your shoes off. (laughs) Because you really were walking on holy ground. And Pierre and Malen lived lives. There was nothing we wanted to do more every time we went to Rwanda than to go and see them. And just have the privilege of being in that little tiny prayer room. Now, Malen wasn't as good as Pierre. She only prayed all through the night every Friday. Pierre was a little disappointed with her, but he did love her. (laughs) And uh, then their threats got worse and worse. We don't know if they're still alive. We have no idea where they are. But they had to be taken out of the country, and we made sure that happened to some safety. Is that how does our face stand up in that? Do we really love our enemies? Do we know what it is to make that extra step of love? and commitment to say, I am going to live, I want to live, as Jesus wants me to live. We need to help one another. We can't just do it as ourselves. We need the body of Christ. We need to demonstrate family in every part of our lives. Stay up here. What? Stay up here. One day recently, two Christian sisters were sitting at home in Pakistan. Someone crept in and snatched one of them. She's never been seen again from that day to this. Persecution is the reality of the world in which we live. And yet the apathy with which we treat our brothers and sisters who are facing so much suffering, is incredible. 28 countries contain major persecution. 57% of the world's population could be persecuted at any time. You've got countries like Saudi Arabia forbidding all religions except one. And North Korea goes one further than that. 
Sometimes the state itself is being worshipped today. For the 20th century, the face of religious persecution changed. First Chinese, then Iranian, then North Korean. Today it can be largely again Chinese. The persecution of Christians is such a basic part of life. We've got to face up to a simple issue. Blessed are those who we stand with in suffering. Blessed are those who we stand with in suffering. Because we are not allowed just to be apathetic and to ignore it. We are taught to demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And to see, as Paul said, that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always that we seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. It is so important. Alistair Begg, the Scottish pastor uh, who has ministered in the States for most of his life, said this, When we manage not to retaliate, we have not yet fully obeyed. As disciples of Jesus, we're not only to refrain from doing our enemies evil, we're actually to do them good. It's not just that you don't do bad to your enemies. It's that you love them. And I know you've been through a tough time as a church. But you know, praise God for that. You're obviously worth bothering with. <laughs> Satan thinks he wants to get rid of you guys. As Clive's already said, love your enemies, but know that that is really good news. When all speak well of you as a church, something's going horribly wrong. When you just live in a constant, you know, oasis, loving the palm trees, waving and enjoying the water, get out. <laughs> get in the garbage dumps. Get alongside people who are hurting. Know that the Lord will turn this around to his glory if you stick with it and know he is the great redeemer. The Fulani is the largest nomadic, well, one of the largest nomadic tribes in North Africa. They are Muslim and uh, very fierce for their faith. I'm going to use American words because I can't say African words very well without insulting. So I'm going to call these two guys David and Peter. Really boring like that. <laughs> now, David was Fulani. David had dreams. Dreams are wonderful. I hope you know that so many Muslims come to Christ through dreams and visions. Incredible. And David came, gave his life to Christ through dreams. And this soon got out into his community and the locals were really angry. So they came as a group to do him in in some way. And they got to him and they got his son and they slaughtered this little boy and left him alone. Did it right in front of the father. For those of us who parents, I can't imagine facing my child being slaughtered in front of my eyes. A few, couple of weeks or so later, the guy who actually carried out the slaughter also had some dreams. And Jesus met him in his dreams. And Peter gave his life to Jesus. So he got to do something about it. He's just killed this other guy's son. And now he's under threat. He's got to flee for his life. So he flees to the original David and asks for forgiveness, which is fully and freely given to him. And then David, the original man, said, come and live in my home. Have your shelter here. We'll look after you. This 
is happening all the time. It's happening every day amongst people who live with far less than we will ever have, who live in a community. You are living in really good community, I gather, from all we hear. It's incredible how you're in these various house churches and different ways of working and ministering together. But I don't think you've seen anything yet to what the Lord wants to do and how he wants to lead you deeper and deeper with him and really reach your community. Martin Luther King said, one of the great tragedies of life is that we seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession, between doing and saying. A persistent schizophrenia leaves so many of us tragically divided against ourselves. On the one hand, we proudly profess certain sublime and noble principles, but on the other hand, we sadly practice the very antithesis of these principles. How often are our lives characterized by high blood pressure of creeds and anemia of deeds? We must forgive and we must move on. I know of a guy who, pastor, God was using him. He'd been trained up. He was supported. He preached on Sunday a wonderful sermon on forgiveness. That next week, he got himself very worked up about some of the people who had stood with him and reacted very strongly against them, and they had to leave the church. Reparation tried to be done. Reconciliation was worked at by those who had left, but nothing was received. When someone you long to forgive doesn't want, well, you can forgive them, but they don't want reconciliation. That's when it gets really tough because then we can get hard and bitter and want, you know, want to do them in. But we have to learn to just trust them in God's hands and say only God can heal the bridges. Now we've just got to love. A verse that I have had thrown at me by God over and over again over the last few years. Be still. And know that I am God. We sometimes try to be God and tell him what to do. Be still. He is God. We've got to get on his page. I want to ask you whether we are creating under God a different tomorrow. I want to ask whether we really are realizing that we are family. I really want to ask whether we are standing with those who are suffering and demonstrating how to love our enemies. And I want to ask you as well, whether we are letting the world see the love and compassion of Jesus in who we are, even as we face opposition. It's a very difficult moment in our history at this time. But God is doing something special. Thank you. God is doing something significant. And we're going to abandon questions for the moment. This was planned before that we would do this. And instead I'm going to ask you a question. And to do that I need to tell you a story. Now Ruth and I have been Americans for we've lived here for 25 years. We've been Americans for most of that time. So when someone says are you British or American I'm not kind of sure. The one thing I can't lose is the accent. (laughs) And the memory of some of the places that I went and some of the things that I knew. And I used to love preaching in British concert halls. 
an amazing place to stand up and declare Jesus. This particular story is uh, completely true. It's about a, an impresario who hired a major London concert hall for a night. And he'd got a young concert pianist and he asked him to come and play. And the young man was thrilled and went to play in this concert hall and the impresario had packed it with people. It was heaving with folks. And he played Bach and he played out of his skin that night. And when he finished, the Brits forgot they were British. <laughs> and they got excited. <laughs> and they stood. And they shouted. And they clapped. And nobody could believe it. A British audience on its feet <laughs> to this young man who had played Bach that night. The young man didn't quite know what to do, so he ran for the green room. <laughs> and there was the impresario waiting for him. And the impresario said, magnificent, glorious, incredible, tremendous, play an encore. <coughs> the young man said, no. The impresario said, you must play an encore. They are standing for you. The young man said, no, they're not all standing. If you look up in the second balcony, on the end, there's those two old guys, and they're sitting. <laughs> the impresario said, oh, they don't know their music. The young man said, oh, yes, they know their music. One of them is my teacher. <laughs> if he was standing and everyone else was sitting, I'd play an encore but they're sitting, no encore. 2,000 years ago, a man named Stephen died. When he died, his face shone as he saw the Jesus he loved and served who sits at the right hand of his Father in heaven. But Scripture does not say Stephen saw Jesus sitting. Scripture says, Stephen saw Jesus standing, standing for one who lived for him, standing for one who was now being stoned to death and dying for him. Stephen saw Jesus standing. I want to ask you something. When you and I make it into the presence of God, Will Jesus be standing or sitting? Will he be sitting to say, welcome home, you lived an ordinary life, you did pretty well. I'm not saying that you can earn your salvation, that's all settled by crucified love. But I am saying you can get Jesus on his feet by the way you live for him, by the way you die for him, by who you are. I want to ask that whatever the newspapers may suggest or whatever anybody may say, I want to ask whether you're the kind of people who get Jesus standing because her, his verdict is the only important one. And I want to ask you this tonight because I want to challenge you with what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I'm going to challenge you with whether you're going to tolerate your enemies or love them. I want to challenge you with whether you're going to go through the rituals of your faith or serve Jesus. I want to challenge you with whether or not you're going to show your community what it really means to love and know a living God or whether they're going to simply write you off as one of those funny Christian people. 
I want to ask whether you and I are going to live in such a way that heaven will rise to recognize what God is doing here among you and that Jesus, my Jesus, will stand because of who you are. It was a long, long time ago when I surrendered to Jesus Christ and I had a problem because I was walking on a street in the east end of London and I'd had no time for Jesus but I'd seen a guy that night who'd lived for Jesus and I recognized something different. And I knew that God was asking for my life. And I looked at the sky and I said, Jesus, I want your life in my life and I want to know you. Would you come? And he said, no. And so I lit up another cigarette and said, you can't treat me like this. You have waited for this long. <laughs> and I thought, I'll try again. God, would you forgive me? Would you take every fiber of my being, everything I have and am, would you take me and make me what you want me to be? Would you put me where you will? And would you use me to your glory? And the whole of my life was turned upside down that day. Relationships, ambitions, expectations, love. And I believe that what is going wrong in this world today is that the people of God are trying to live a respectable, conformist Christian life when God wants a radical, rebellious alternative of people who will love their enemies do good to those who despitefully use them, a people who will be so passionate in who they are for Jesus that they won't stop announcing to the world that there is a God who lives in heaven and wants to live in your life and my life here on this earth, a God who wants to change this world through his people. But to do that, he's got to get a people who will get Jesus standing by who they are. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you to do something very simple. We're going to pray. <laughs> if you want to take this prayer for yours, I want to ask you to stand while we pray. If you don't, I want you to stay sitting. You may say, well, that means I'm going to be a second-class Christian. No, it doesn't. Your turn tomorrow. <laughs> I just want to ask if God's speaking to you tonight. I want to ask if you're ready to love your enemies. If you're ready to let Jesus transform your life, you don't have to do it. He's going to do it. I want to ask if you're ready for his Holy Spirit to make you totally different. I want to ask if you're ready to continue as part of a church that's going to turn this world upside down with the love of Jesus. If you don't feel that call of God on your heart and life tonight, please stay sitting and pray for those who are standing. Your turn another time. But if you do want to say to Jesus, I'm ready, let's go. Let's change a little bit of this world for Jesus. Then I'm going to ask you while we pray, if you'll stand, we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, some of us are sitting and we're sitting because we're being honest and we're ready and waiting for the moment you have for us. Some of us are standing because we're sensing your call and we want to surrender 
to what you would have for us. Lord, bless you. Forgive us as a church for any way we have missed what you would have for us. But take us as a church and accept our surrender and continue to use us as you have so mightily in months and years past. Lord, as we stand, would you take our lives so that one day, many years later, you will stand when we get home to say, welcome home. You did what I called you to do. You loved your enemies. You changed your world. You blessed the heart of your God. You demonstrated the work of the king and his kingdom. Now enter into the joy of your Father and know his blessing for eternity. Lord, we surrender to you. We thank you. We acknowledge you. We give you our praise in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. And those more Pentecostally inclined added, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs>